Okay, in your Bibles this morning, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and I'm going to read from verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 9. For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. To the present hour we hunger and thirst, we are poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless, and we labor working with our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. But I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then, be imitators of me. That's why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ. As I teach them everywhere in every church. Some are arrogant, as though I weren't coming to you. But I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills, and I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod? with love and a spirit of gentleness. Read verse 20 again, the first, uh, all of verse 20 actually. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. You could forgive people for thinking otherwise. So often, Those who talk the loudest and whose words do not back up what their works do not back up what they are saying are those who profess some external form of religion. Particularly, it is a travesty. It ought not to be when Christians run their mouths about all that should be done and all that could be done and all that they prefer and like and all that they don't like and yet their lives are inconsistent with the very truths they proclaim. Why is it that we have Christians, people who are born again of the Holy Spirit of God, or so far as we know are, and they've professed faith in Jesus, and they've they've testified to that in the waters of baptism. Men, in history, like, um, uh, let's just draw one out, Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass was an abolitionist in the 1800s of the United States. He was a follower of Jesus Christ. And he said he loved Jesus. He loved Christ. And he loved the Christianity of Christ. But he said of his uh, racist, enslaving, segregating context in 19th century America, but I detest the Christianity of this land. Why is it that you have non-Christians crossing from men like Frederick Douglass to people like 
Gandhi in India who, who, who say, you know, I, I like your Christ, but I don't like your Christians. Why is it that in the present day, you can buy t-shirts quite easily that say, Lord, save me from your followers? Why is it that you have only to turn on the television to see a, a stereotype of a Christian as a very unpleasant person, a very self-righteous person, a very hypocritical person with a sort of pinched up nose and a scowl and a sort of snarling demeanor. And sometimes the person's a psychopath. Sometimes they turn out to be a murderer or, you know, I, I don't know, they've, they've blown up someplace or killed somebody in the name of Jesus. Why, why is that? Of course, we know that, that the scriptures tell us there is, an, there is a satanic assault on the people of God. Yes, there is a lot of slander. Yes, there is a lot that is seeking to defame the name of Christ and diminish the glory of the gospel. But people say it about every other. I hear Christians say that stereotypes have their roots in reality. And that came from somewhere. The script's writer, maybe they hate Christians, maybe they hate Jesus, maybe they hate the Bible, but, but their experience of someone fuels that. And I, I certainly can say, oh, I know people like that. I've met people like that. I've heard people like that. The horrific inconsistencies and incongruities that, that characterize us. Forget people out of the room. Let's think about us and let's think about our own sins. Our own, you know, if, if we're caught at a bad time or, 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 you know, we respond to something in a bad way because we're, I don't know, under a lot of pressure maybe. Or maybe it's just because we have sin still in our heart that needs to be repented of. You know what I'm saying? I hope. And let's be honest. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We've already messed eternity up for ourselves apart from the grace of God in Jesus. And so we, you know, we, we trust in Jesus. I sometimes wonder though, is it we trust in Jesus because we want to be with him forever in heaven? Or is it more we trust in Jesus because we don't want to go to hell? There's a difference between people who trust in Jesus because they, they don't want to go to hell and people who genuinely want to be in heaven. You know what I'm saying? You know, big difference. And I, I'm not saying that one uh, it, it, it group of people are not, are not born again Christians because certainly, you know, we don't want to, to, we don't want to go to hell. You know, it's a terrible place. But then sometimes the way we live our lives communicates to a watching world the things that we say, the things that we do, the things that the world's not watching, but God is watching, that we think, and the way those work their way out in what we say and what we do. I don't know, I'm just, I'm burdened by that. And I'm just increasingly so. I'm burdened about it in myself. I'm burdened about it in others. I'm burdened about it not just in others outside. I'm burdened about it in our church. I hope you're following me. The kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. Let me break that down for us this morning. The kingdom of God does not consist in talk. Why does the kingdom of God not consist in talk? Because the God that we worship and serve who saved us for himself is not a God of just talk. I like to think in categories. Forgive me for being slightly OCD. Uh, I, I don't think it's OCD. I think it's neat and orderly. But um, I've been told otherwise. Creation, covenant, Christ, and kingdom. And in all of these things, we see that God is not just a God of talk. God in creation did not just say, let there be. Right? He doesn't just speak and there's no effect. 
It, it, God is, it, is not the God of, of uh, that, that old poem where, where he's kind of clueless and he's some sort of cosmic Winnie the Pooh thinking by the riverside. He's created everything and he's like, I'm, I feel lonely. And so it says he thought and he thought and he thought and then he decided, I'll make me a man. God is a, even a, a God of just thought. God is the originator of thought. God is the originator of speech, but he doesn't just in the counsel of his own will and speech just do a bunch of nonsense. We wouldn't be here if God were just a God of talk. Covenant. God did not just say to Abraham, I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you. I will bless those who bless you. And in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. He didn't just say that. God backs up what he says. Christ, the eternal creative word made flesh, the embodiment of God's promise of blessing in Abraham, God with us. When when Christ lived among us, he pronounced healing of the sick. Now, uh, there, there are plenty of charlatans out there who pronounce healing. I'm all about praying for healing. You want, you, 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 you want to, to come and pray for your healing, we will pray for you. Please do not withhold that opportunity from your elders because the Bible commands us to. Yeah? But pronouncing healing is actually something that it's, it's a bit different. And there's lots of people out there that are pronouncing healings and they're saying, I mean, you, they're, they're saying, you are healed, not, you know, not. May you be healed in the name of Jesus, but you are healed in the name of Jesus as though by some sort of new age power of positive thinking, they can suddenly drop their chemotherapy. Some people have, and they have died. And so there are quite a few people doing idiotic things in the name of Jesus. But when Jesus said, be healed... He didn't have to say be healed in the name of Jesus because he was Jesus. He is the authority. He is the power in which people are healed. He can pr- we, we can only pray for healing. Read James. We anoint the person with oil. We lay hands. We pray for their healing. But Jesus pronounces healing. You are healed. Go and be clean. But you remember that, that, that guy who was, who was crippled. Jesus did more than pronounce healing. Man's crippled. And Jesus says, take up your, your mat and walk. And they're all looking at him like, oh, what, what was he saying? Sorry, um, I think he actually began by saying, your sins are forgiven. That was the greater thing. That was almost, it's like his priority. They lowered him to be healed of his physical sins. Jesus started with healing him of his spiritual sins. Your sins are forgiven. And they're like, who is this who forgives sins? Now you think, I, which is easier, to forgive him of his sins or to say, take up your mat and walk? Well, obviously, take up your mat and walk. But they're saying, oh, you know, um, <laughs> don't really know, you know, what, what the right answer. I, however we answer, we're kind of incriminated. He says, well, to prove you, to you that I can do both. Take up your mat and walk. Get out of here. You know, the kid stands up on his feet and takes up his mat and walks. Not only healed physically, but forgiven spiritually. Why? Because Jesus had the power. Jesus did not simply communicate in talk. When he pronounced healing of the sick and forgiveness of sins, it's not just words. So it is also with God's kingdom. Those people who carry the banner of Christ as Lord. You are the kingdom of God. We are the kingdom of God. I hope I'm not standing outside that sort of circle. We, we are God's kingdom. And Paul says the kingdom of God does not consist in talk. We are not and cannot be people of mere talk. Perhaps if you're not understanding, maybe we can illustrate this with reference to uh, another passage of Scripture. Uh, in the book of Ezekiel, the Lord comes to the prophet and 
basically describes the way people were responding to him. He says, as for you, son of man, your people are talking about you near the city walls and in the doorways of their houses. Ezekiel has made quite a sensational appearance in the city. One person speaks to another, each saying to his brother, come and hear what the message is that comes from the Lord. Now, I'm just reading it. I could stop right there and, you know, I'm sure that I dare say it's been done. Some One of these guys who just opens the Bible and rips a verse out and says, oh, I like that. And I think I'm going to preach on that. You know, I can see someone preaching a sermon about how this is how we ought to be. Oh, if only, if only we were talking about the messenger of God in our houses and in our doorsteps. And if only we were saying, come, hear the message that the Lord has given to us. They miss the point of the text. The Lord continues, so my people come to you in crowds. I can see the guy saying, oh, if only people came to hear the word in crowds. Keep reading. They sit in front of you. They hear your words, but they don't obey them. Their mouths go on. I love that expression. Their mouths go on passionately. But they can flap their gums all they like. Their hearts pursue dishonest profit. They are corrupt. And it's the desire of their heart is not the desire of God. It's not desire for God. It's not desire to please God. But they're they're out to see what can we get dishonestly. What schemes can we contrive? What ways can we can we go about? You know, our, our improving our financial stability and financial security. Because after all, I'm number one. They just sat and heard a man preach justice. Preach mercy, preach love, preach, preach honesty and purity and holiness. What is, what's going on? And the thing is, they enjoy it. They enjoy the preaching. I wish people enjoyed the preaching. I'm not so sure sometimes. I wish, I wish, you know, this place was packed out. I, I, I just... I wish we had the problem that this place could not hold any more people. And, 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 and you know what? Used to, I thought, in terms of, okay, if we get to that point, we knock out that wall and we knock out that wall and stuff. But then I started thinking, do we want to build a cathedral here or do we want to, to build a, 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 a body of people that go out and proclaim the gospel? What about our brothers and sisters who, who live over in this area or who live in that area? Why don't, why don't they start meeting uh, you know, as, a, as a church and, and, and you know, see a, a new family of Christ people grow up there and you know, stuff like that? Wouldn't that be wonderful? But that will never happen if people are just coming in a crowd, sitting, listening, enjoying, but not obeying. We'll never get there. God forbid that be the case. But I I want us to take a deep look inside to see how will we grow? How will we advance? How will we be strong? It will not come from disobedience. It will not come from, you know, the, the, your misbehaviors in the week. Or your inactivity in the week. It comes as people commit themselves to the way of the cross, to following Jesus. Verse 32 of that, sorry, that text in uh, Ezekiel. Yes, He describes them like this. Yes, to them you're like a singer of passionate songs who has a beautiful voice and plays skillfully on an instrument. They hear your words, but they don't obey them. I can think of all sorts of of people who are treated for entertainment But the moment they speak up and show that they actually have a brain beyond their talent and their skill, 
people are like, don't like you. Don't, don't talk to us about, you know, abortion. And don't talk to us about racism. And don't talk to us about, you know, sexual morality and commitment. Don't, you know what I'm saying? It's like you just, person shows that they can do something a little more than play the piano and sing a nice song or play football or, or you know, do something. They're there for the entertainment. But when they show that they're a person made in the image of God and they may very well be remade in the image and likeness of Christ and are able to speak prophetically into the culture in some way, uh, that's when the person loses everybody's interest. Stay in your lane, you're told. Even pastors get told that. Just preach the gospel. Don't talk about other issues. And sometimes there's a, there's a cost to that. They hear your words, but they don't obey them. Yet when all this comes true, God says, and it definitely will, then they will know that a prophet has been among them. When it's too late... That's when people see. When everything's crashing down in this context, the world as they know it is destroyed. And that's when they sit up and they notice. The thing is, we've set the bar too low. I I know I have. I think people sit up and notice when they show up. That's not it. I mean, certainly they're not sitting up and noticing if they're absent. But just because people show up doesn't mean they're living out. That's what I want to urge you today, to call you to, to, to Christ's likeness, to the pursuit of the way of the cross, to lives of power in the name of Jesus by the Holy Spirit. Why? Because again, the kingdom of God does not consist in talk. But let me move on. Um, um, You know, the kingdom of God does consist in power. So those people that that God was addressing um, uh, when he was talking to Ezekiel, they like a good sermon, but they still live lives of corruption. Today, some people don't even go so far as to enjoy a sermon Why they even show up mystifies me. They come together for a show, not to serve, as though church is some sort of grown-up story time, not the worship of God and meaningful fellowship of believers. If there's any shred of this attitude or behavior in your life, I'm not just saying the kingdom of God is not of talk. I'm saying it is of power. I'm not showing you simply what you should not be like, what you should not do. I'm trying to show you what you should be like and what you should do. You must change. You have to change. Please don't walk away here talking about how convicted you are because that means nothing if you have not changed. This is for your good, for your blessing, for your benefit. The kingdom of God consists in power. I want you to live in that power, to know that power, to enjoy that power, to see and experience that power at work in and through you. You will never experience that or know that or enjoy that blessing so long as you you sit back and just enjoy the show. Why do I say the kingdom of God consists in power? Because God, that, you know, God is not a God of talk. God is a God of all power. God said, let there be, and there was. God said, I'll make a great nation of you, Abraham, and he did. God said, in you will all the families of the earth be blessed. And indeed, all the families of the earth are blessed forever in Abraham's offspring, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Christ said, your sins are forgiven, and they were. Christ gave his life on the cross for our sins to ensure the forgiveness that he pronounced. And with his last, last words, he pronounced victory. It is finished. Paid in full. Because he had indeed finished it. 
Would you like it if, you know, you've been paying off some debt for a long time and then you get that sort of notice stamped, paid in full? And then next month, just kidding. Would you appreciate that? And wouldn't that be a cruel, wicked joke for them to do? Even if, even if they got your, your records mixed up with someone else's and someone else had actually paid theirs off and they sent you their paid in full and your heart's lifted and you're like, all that, you don't even bother looking into it even though you think it might not be right. You know, you'd, be, you'd still be ticked off, wouldn't you? If you got some notice like that and it's not true, if they mess up the calculations somehow, absolutely. God doesn't mess up the calculations. Jesus pays an infinite price for the sins of everyone who will believe on him so that as you trust in him, you can know forgiveness of your sins. There's a lot that you can change about yourself. But one thing you can never change or take away is your sin and the consequence of your sin. Jesus has to change that. In his life, Christ told us what the kingdom is like, what his people are like in the kingdom. He often did this through parables. I want you to consider those parables about the kingdom. They're filled with activity, with energy, with power, not inactivity. Why? Because the kingdom of God is is powerful. It's one of power. The God of the kingdom is powerful. The kingdom of heaven, he says, is, it, it may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that man takes and sows. And that grain grows and it grows and it grows until it grows larger than any other plant in the garden. So large that birds are able to nest in it. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. Found by a man, covered up, and the man sells all that he has and he buys the field so that he can have that treasure. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls who, while he's doing his search, he he finds a pearl of really great value. A beautiful pearl, incomparable to anything else that he has. He sells all of his stock so that he can buy that one pearl. The kingdom of heaven is like a net thrown into the sea and it gathers all kinds of fish, some good and some bad, which are then sorted with the good kept and the bad thrown away. All of these images are images of activity and images of power, are they not? If the kingdom of heaven is like this, if the kingdom of heaven is busy and thriving and bustling and powerful, why are we not? Why are we sluggish? Why are we inactive? Why are we just blasé about the worship of God? Like, oh, you know what I mean. Let's be honest about ourselves. We approach God with sluggish passivity. Like, you know, we can creep into his presence as some sort of humanoid snails. When he calls us to be remade in the image and likeness of Jesus. Filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. The point that I'm trying to make is that God is powerful and his kingdom is one of power. This, the people in his kingdom should be people of power. Not just of talk. And how we relate to God and how we relate to each other. The problem with the church at Corinth and the text that that we've, we've read is that they are running their mouths about all sorts of things. And they're going so far as to slander the Apostle Paul. And later in his second letter, they're even questioning whether he's a legit apostle. And they're elevating other personalities above Paul. And they're all just a very unpleasant environment, okay? And the apostle is saying, yeah, they think I'm not coming. I planted the church, right? I will come 
Lord willing. And, and these arrogant people, I have a message for them. I'll find out their talk from their power. And I can come with a rod or I can come with a spirit of gentleness. What will it be? They probably didn't like that. I mean, I can imagine as this letter is read, people resenting it. You could probably in the church that day when it was, because it would have been read publicly in worship, you know. You can almost feel the bubbling of the tension in the room. Someone over here, you know, trying to speak up, you know, and this person over here sort of, you know, they do that thing where they, their, their jaw gets clenched and they, they're sort of, their lips sort of pinched in and sort of, you know, they're just sort of restless and squirming. And then someone gets up and walks out in a big huff, much louder than was necessary. <laughs> you can imagine it. And Paul says, it's the word of the Lord. And, and that's what I'm trying to encourage you toward today, us today, to hear the word of the Lord and to consider, are we arrogant people who just flap our gums about stuff or are we filled with the power of Jesus? How do we relate to God? How do we relate to each other? Please stop talking. Stop saying, I'm planning to do this. I might do this. I feel God calling me to help in this way. I need to rethink my priorities beyond what provides for and interests me and see the bigger picture of what Christ has for me. No, I, I want to seek more to please God, to live more for His glory and the temporal and eternal good of my neighbor. I'm thinking about giving more. I want to be involved as much as possible in church life. So I'm going to make more of an effort to, don't know, I'm, I'm going to attend growth groups on Sunday morning. I'm going to attend the, the, both services on a Sunday morning and evening. I'm going to, to linger afterwards to engage guests in conversation and to, to fellowship with brothers and sisters. And, 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 and I, I'm, I'm going to attend prayer meeting and I'm going to go to the, the, the women's Bible study and I'm going to start up a men's Bible study. And, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do all of this stuff. I, I've fallen into really bad habits of not being on time. First, I was five minutes late. Then I was 10. Then I was 20. Then 30. Now I'm an hour. That's going to change now. I've resolved it. I'm going to be more disciplined in personal prayer and Bible reading, more intentional in Christian friendship, more active in sharing my faith, more, more active in, bring, in telling people about Jesus and encouraging friends and family to join the, um, uh, with me for uh, worship of God in church. I'm going to be more welcoming to visitors. The list goes on. And I've heard people probably say all of these things in one way or the other. All good things. I even got a text at the beginning of the year from someone not, not present um, said, I've committed to God that I will not miss a single service this year. Someone I was seeking to hold accountable. Two days later, they missed the first Sunday of the, the new year. They missed the next Sunday after that. Two Sundays into the month, they're not at any service or any prayer meeting or even conversing. What's that about? Stop talking. I don't want to hear any of this stuff. These are, not, these are good things, but they're not good things to say. They are good things to do. When we stop seeing God as a hobby... And see Him rather as holy. We will worship and serve Him because He is worthy. When we stop treating church as a possible option. And start treating it as a privileged opportunity. We will worship together and help one another. Because we are family in Jesus. 
Paul calls the Corinthians to imitate him. His example is one of power, is it not? He's being sarcastic, by the way. Probably best not to use this as an excuse for sinful sarcasm. Some of us can all have a bit of attitude at times, I'm sure. I know I can. And, you know, have to fight that impulse to hit back with something cutting. It's very tempting to sort of pull this out of the the arsenal in such moments. He says, um, We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. He doesn't mean it. Okay. That's not, that, that's in context. He's, he's already said, you have what you want. You've become rich. You're kings. Wish you were. Then we would reign with you. <laughs> His point is, Christ followers, including himself, they're a spectacle to the world. They're mocked. They're foolish for Christ. They're weak for Christ. They're held in disrepute for Christ. They hunger and thirst because of Christ. They're poorly dressed, buffeted, and homeless because their priorities have been built around Jesus, not themselves. They labor hard and they work honorably because they want to glorify Christ. They're reviled but blessed. They're persecuted but endure. They're slandered but they entreat. He says, we've become like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. Come and join us. Join us as refuse. Join us as the scum of the world. We're not really the scum of the world. We're the light of the world. The salt of the earth. People might not look very kindly upon us at times because of their sad and tragic negative experiences with people or on the other hand because of their rebellion against God and their hatred for all things Christ but we have an example here to follow to be sacrificial not to be spectators but to surrender yourselves fully to Jesus to move from self-righteous pride to savior focused praise Stop watching and get working. Stop talking and start doing. Yes, Jesus did pay it all, but all to him I owe. No, we're not saved by good works, but we are, according to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. To be positively different. And one day, the Son of Man will come in his glory, and all the angels with him, and he will sit on a glorious throne. And before him will be gathered all the nations, and he'll separate people from other people, like a shepherd separates. The sheep. He'll place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. They look and they wonder, Why me? Why us? For I was hungry. And you gave me food. I was thirsty. And you gave me drink. I was a stranger. And you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison. And you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him and say, Lord, when when did we see you? Hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And When did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? When did we see you in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them on that day, truly, I, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. 
But then he'll say to those on his left, remember the goats, yeah? Depart from me, you cursed. Into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you didn't give me any food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. And then they'll answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you like this? Hungry and thirsty and naked and in prison and all that stuff. We don't remember that, Jesus. And he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you didn't do it to me. And they'll go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Where will you be on that day? Paul isn't coming anymore. Paul is dead. Don't know where he's buried, but he's not around, okay? You don't have to worry about Paul coming to you with a rod. I guess maybe as you read 1 Corinthians, you might, and, and I, as I preach through 1 Corinthians, you might feel, you know, oh, Paul is sort of, sort of coming to us still today through his words with a bit of a rod. Yeah, <coughs> maybe. Sometimes the application stings a bit. But it's not Paul's arrival that we should be concerned about or looking toward. It's Jesus's, Christ's. He's coming. Don't content yourself with where you're at. Don't rest complacently in your inactivity. Don't don't deflect and say, but what about that person? What about this person? What about them? You're here today. You're the one hearing this. Maybe that person that you're worried about is one of these sick people he's talking about. One of these poor people, one of these hungry people, one of these naked people, one of these these imprisoned people. Maybe they have some serious issues they're going through. And because you're not fellowshipping, you don't know it. Because you're not really sharing life as a Christian with them. Um, You don't really have that connection. Just saying, it's possible. How do we relate to each other? How do we relate to our God? Are we people of talk or are we people of power? I pray it's the latter for everyone's sake and for the glory of God and for the good of our neighbors. Amen.